Hello, hello, everyone, and welcome to Wellness on Wednesday, a captivating series that promotes walking as a powerful tool for enhancing health and reducing arthritis and joint pain. I'm Denise Stegall. I'm the curator at livinghealthylist.com, and I will be your host for this series, uh, Wellness on Wednesday. I just love the sound of that. The Rochester Clinic and Lotus Health Foundation, known for their strong commitment to community and well-being, have taken the lead in organizing this series of virtual health talks. Um, and thanks to Let's Walk Minnesota, uh, which is a campaign that is sponsored by the Minnesota Department of Health and funded by the Center of Disease Control and Prevention, uh, we have this amazing opportunity to bring this initiative to you uh, throughout the month of June. Now, if you've missed a few, we've had several already. Um, if you've missed a few, go to rochesterclinic.com and check out the replays. This is These conversations are truly, these are conversations that can change your life. The life this information is stuff that you need to know in order to live that healthy lifestyle that you've been searching for. Now, during these talks, our presenters are going to guide you in discovering exactly how walking um, provides um, you with enhanced quality of life. And that's what we're all looking for. We all want better. We all want to continue to grow. And it's the quality of life that we really need to focus on. And of course, we do that through whole food, plant-based nutrition. We talk about movement and lifestyle medicine and how that those pieces can contribute to improve your arthritis health and your overall health too. So our speaker for this week's WOW, well, this on Wednesday, is Dr. Jen Yu Lai. Dr. Lai is, he's a doctor of podiatric medicine, lifestyle medicine, and chief manager at Rochester Clinic. His topic today is whole person approach or the whole person approach to managing ankle osteoarthritis, uh, in which he will shed light on how lower extremity health is important to maintaining a healthy lifestyle and, and living healthy um, moving forward. So Dr. Lai, hello and welcome back. Thank you. It's, Absolutely. It's, it's exciting to be here. I'm excited to, I am really excited for your talk today because um, I mentioned earlier, I know I've been having some issues uh, with my ankle. So I am really interested to hear, you know, what's going on and, and what are things that I can do uh, every day to, uh, to make that better. And so I can, you know, live healthy, vibrantly um, from now until the time I'm 101. Well, the oldest patient I ever had was 114. So. 101 is not enough yet. <laughs> okay, <laughs> maybe 114 then. Yeah. Well, let me um, let me just quickly make sure that you have the ability to give us your presentation, which you should, um, and then please take it away. Okay, thank you. Okay, let me share my screen. Share. Oh. Can you see my screen now? Yes. Okay. Wait. Um, the only thing is. Okay. So today I'm going to talk about ankle osteoarthritis. Um, maybe you're wondering why I talk about whole person care. Osteoarthritis by itself is very lifestyle related, and ankle is more complicated complicated than other uh, osteoarthritis in other joints. So let's, okay. So today I'm going to talk about common systemic causes of ankle osteoarthritis and also the local causes and how we do it in the whole person approach to manage this ankle uh, osteoarthritis. Osteoarthritis, usually called the OA, is the most common form of arthritis. Um, it affects about 15% of adults globally. And knee is usually the most common joint that being affected by OA. Uh, it's, it's about 10% of men and 13% of women over 60 years old. However, ankle osteoarthritis is more common than knee or hip 
in the young active population. So if you have an ankle osteoarthritis, you're pretty young and active, I hope. And the most surprisingly, the treatments for ankle osteoarthritis are less satisfactory. They mean not as effective, and also they last not as long than the treatment in other joints. So when we talk about common causes of ankle osteoarthritis, I like to talk about the systemic, the local, and lifestyle. Systemic, I'm going to focus on female, obesity, bone density, and atherosclerosis, meaning the reduced circulation. Arthritis, when this is very important in women's health. Um, the pelvis is different in men and women. Um, the pelvis in women is wider because of childbirth. But because it's wider, uh, this angle, we call it Q angle. This is the angle of the femur, the thigh bone, and your body. This is called Q angle. This angle is wider in female. It doesn't seem that very different. However, you look at this in the normal, um, we call it a normal knee. The Q angle is about less than 15. When you increase the Q angle, just like the, uh, in the female, it usually have the knock knee. So it's very common to see women that, that when they walk, the knee are almost touching with each other. And then bow leg will be um, less than 10 degrees. So when you look at here, when this ball, you look at the, the ankle, not only the knee, but also the ankle, it has to turn. So why does it make a difference? So when you look at the ball mechanics, you can come up from the top because of this angle and your body weight, it changes the, your, your joints. But at the same time, um, your foot and ankle can also change it. So that's how the female is a, uh, has prone to have osteoarthritis. And the next one is obesity, body weight. Um, I have to mention that last week, if you missed Dr. Esser's talk last week, you should review it. Um, it has a, we have a lot of overlapping information. Also, when we, when we discuss it multiple times, that means it's very important information. He mentioned the body weight at the same time. When we walk, um, if you think about it, when we walk, we have about 50% of the time, there's only one leg on the ground. That means the leg bears the body weight. Because we're walking, besides the body weight, you have some speed over there. So when we are walking, on average, we put one and a half times our body weight on one foot. And then when we are running or jogging, that's three to four times body weight. But if you're playing like basketball, tennis ball, racquetball, or not a pickleball, it could be up to eight times your body weight on your foot, on your joint. So, and that's why um, the body weight has a lot of impacts on the osteoarthritis. Higher BNI uh, increase the risk and severity of ankle osteoarthritis. Obesity, definition of obesity alone increases the risk of ankle osteoarthritis by 26%. And by losing the body weight 10% or more can reduce the risk of ankle osteoarthritis. So the, the weight plays a big issue in ankle. And bone density. Um, when the bone density is decreased, there's an increased risk of fracture. And we will talk about fracture and the ankle osteoarthritis. And because the bone is not as strong, it would change the joint loading pattern in the ankle. And the lo loading pattern meaning the force on the joint. It also increases joint instability. Probably everyone experienced the ankle sprain uh, not because the ankle sprain is coming from the ankle instability. The ankle is not stable enough to hold it there, and then you have the ankle sprain. And when the bone density is not as uh, strong, and you will increase the instability. And at the same time, because the bone density is low, you impair the bone healing. Now, osteoarthritis is a disease of the joint and the bone. So if the bone healing uh, ability is reduced, 
it increases the chances of getting osteoarthritis and also reduces the chance of healing from osteoarthritis. Arthrosclerosis. Um, Dr. Esther mentioned about circulation also. When we have arthritis, the body has to heal from it. When we have the reduced circulation, um, our healing ability is reduced. And also at the same time, because the body doesn't have sufficient um, circulation or nutrients, it's easier for the joint to be degenerated, to be destroyed. And at the same time, um, arthrosclerosis, as we know, it has a lot of information comes with it. It's, it's a very inflammatory process. And when we have uh, arthrosclerosis, that means our body has increased inflammation in general, uh, which would increase the chance of a joint degeneration. And, and most of the time, arthrosclerosis also is associated with decreased physical activities. That is a correlation right there. So that's a STEMI. Let's talk about the local. When we talk about local, meaning it's specific to the joint. Uh, the most common cause of ankle osteoarthritis is trauma or injury. And, and then we we'll talk about the re repetitive use of joints and also the muscle, the soft tissue. Up to 80% of ankle osteoarthritis resulted from trauma or injury. It doesn't mean that um, it in injured the joints directly, but a lot of time it set off the event for the joint to be in, in, uh, unstable or changing the loading pattern like that, and they will increase the, the chance of arthritis. So when we talk about repetitive stress, when we talk about osteoarthritis, everyone talk about overuse. So when we talk about overuse, it's not only overuse, it's really we put a stress there every day. And when we look at the normal ankle joint, you see this nice joint space right here. It looks pretty good. But when you look at osteoarthritis, um, you see the force right here. You don't see this decreased uh, joint space across the board. It's not the whole joint, it's only one area. And that is a, the point of osteoarthritis. It doesn't happen uh, just by across the whole joint. You only have one area, that's because of the biomechanics. When we have abnormal biomechanics, just like we mentioned earlier, from the, for example, from the pelvis, you have a different structure, different angle. You change the, the alignment of the knee of the ankle. At the same time, when you look at this, this foot, it's called, we so-called neutral, normal position. The force is distributed evenly across the joint. But when your heel is not straight or your foot is not straight, you put, you put a pressure in one specific area. And that's pretty much just like uh, we look at right here, it's only in one area. That's because from the abnormal uh, biomechanics. And this can come from above the knee or above the foot or under the ankle, that's from the heel. Um, and that's from the biomechanics. So the, not only the reparative um, forces, but also because the abnormal biomechanics causes the forces to be applied to a specific area. There's excessive forces in one specific area. And next one, we'll talk about soft tissue. When you look at one ankle joint, it's not just the bone. The joint is held together by soft tissue. So you can look at the muscles, tendons and all of the ligaments. When they are too tight or they are too loose or too weak, you change the, the function or pattern of the joint. So when you do that, um, again, you, you put extra um, forces in one specific area and that's how it will lead to the osteoarthritis. And when we look at the soft tissue, we always talk about, oh, maybe that's the aging, maybe that's because inactivity, everything. But one thing people don't usually talk about is hormone. How often we women will say, oh, my, my, my feet are bigger after the pregnancy or the joints are, are loose after pregnancy. And that's because in the late pregnancy, you have 
uh, the body is really relaxing to relax all the joints, everything uh, to prepare for childbirth. However, it's not only the pregnancy. Estrogen will affect the stiffness and healing of the soft tissue. And as we all know, estrogen doesn't happen just during pregnancy. It's either from your pregnancy or it's a menopause, even the oral uh, contraceptives and on uh, um, just a regular hormone substitute or the monthly um, hormone production. It all changes the hormone content throughout the month. And all this will change the property, mechanical property of the uh, soft tissue, like the collagen, the tendon, that, that. And so here, by measuring the angle of the knee, because as I mentioned, that the joint is held together by soft tissue. When we measure the, the, the knee angle, it's pretty much like measuring the mechanical, indirectly measuring the mechanical properties of the tendons surrounding the knee. And you can see this, <coughs> excuse me, um, the angle changes throughout the month. So next, I want to talk about osteoarthritis and lifestyle. What we mean by lifestyle. And osteoarthritis, we come in from the overuse. That's a very common sense, the common knowledge that is overused. However, it also happens to inactivity. If we don't use the muscles, the muscles become weak and tight, and they change the, the function of the joints. And at the same time, you change the loading pattern and you put more stress in one specific area. And then nutrition, uh, for the joints, for the soft tissue to, to regenerate, to grow or to heal from anything, we need the proper nutrition. But nutrition doesn't just go there. You need to have good circulation to carry all those nutrients to the joints, to the surrounding uh, area. And all of these are lifestyle related. And that's why I mentioned that um, osteoarthritis is really a lifestyle related uh, condition. So osteoarthritis management. Uh, number one, we wanna assess and correct about mechanical issues. And then we wanna look at lifestyle. About mechanical issues, um, as I mentioned before, um, you wanna make sure your ankle, your, your foot, your leg, everything's in perfect alignment. It doesn't just happen in the lower extremity. It happened, could be coming up from your spine, from your hip, your knee, uh, down to your ankle. But at the same time, it could be coming from your foot because the foot will change in the, the loading pattern. Um, think about, you don't have any forces on your ankle joint unless you're walking. And the force is coming from um, your foot reacting to you, to, to the ground, to your walking. And so you have to look at not only um, your alignment about the ankle, but also your foot and ankle. But at the same time, um, since we're looking at this, this picture, I wanna mention something that is the custom orthotics. Now, a lot of time we say, oh, you have osteoarthritis or you have any issue, you use um, custom orthotics um, to help your uh, issue. However, most people, they say, oh, I step into a foam, a foam box to make an impression. You look at this one. Uh, if your foot and ankle is straight, you don't need orthotics. But if you are not, when you step into a foam box, the position is not straight already. It's not normal already. So you are not going to make a, a good pair of orthotics from the from the imprints or in a position that is abnormal. So there's something uh, I want you to keep in mind when you look at the treatment options. Lifestyle adjustment. Why, why are we talking about lifestyle adjustment? The ankle joint, uh, I think Dr. Esther mentioned, mentioned this one, also Dr. Egerval. It's a lot of information inside the body that cause the joint disease. And when you look at the joint disease, um, it usually is what we call it chronic inflammation. The systemic chronic inflammation is not only in the disease, uh, in the joint. Um, it can come from 
anything from the, your GI, from your food, from um, inactivity, obesity, or even the infection or environmental toxin. They will all increase the inflammation inside our body. And all of this will cause a lot of the so-called metabolic syndrome, um, diabetes, cardiovascular disease, cancer, um, not, and also the joint disease, of course. And lifestyle is the most effective anti-inflammatory modality we have. Uh, it's not only that it's treating the root cause, it, it also is looking at different aspects of your life. And it's just like sending one team out instead of just one firefighter to fight a fire. And that's the way I, I like to look at it is that a whole team approach is just a single person. And so what, what do we do about the lifestyle? We look at the six basic pillars of a healthy lifestyle. So when you look at uh, my logo, so it's a plant-based nutrition and you have the physical activity and you have the stress management, social connection, you have sleep and your passion. That we'll, we'll go over that one uh, period at a time. Nutrition. The principle we talk about nutrition is plant-based, whole food, SOS free. This SOS is no refined sugar, no or reduced oil, because oil by definition is refined already. It's not a whole food. And then we wanna know or reduce salt. Um, we, we, we can obtain sufficient salt from our food already. Uh, so unless you have any, some medical conditions we can get by without adding extra salt uh, during our cooking. When we have a whole food plant-based diet, we, we can obtain a lot of antioxidants. And the antioxidants is the one that um, they will combat the, um, we call the free radicals and reduce inflammation. And how do we know we have sufficient antioxidants? And then we like to say, eat a rainbow because every color is one type of antioxidant. So when you eat a rainbow, you have a, 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 a lot of antioxidants in your food. And also micronutrients. We're not talking about macro. Macro is the carbohydrate, it is the fat and protein, that's a macronutrient. But we're talking about micronutrients that is very essential in our daily um, body functions. Fibers. Fibers are very important for the GI microbiome and weight management. Uh, when we talk about fibers, people in right now um, buy a lot of probiotics. Those are the, the, the microorganism bacteria that build up our microbiome. However, we need to feed them. They have to eat something in order to modify, to, to grow in our guts. Their food, which is called prebiotic, is fibers. Yeah, basically just fibers. Yeah, so if you eat a whole food plant-based diet, you provide enough food to grow your uh, microbiome. And that will be very good in your weight management at the same time. Um, and, then, uh, and also um, whole food plant-based can provide a lot of na uh, natural oxide. Natural oxide is the one that increase blood vessel flexibility. Um, for it, it, it comes from natural glycerin. If the pharmaceutical, that's uh, someone has angina, uh, chest pain, they put it uh, nitric acid under the tongue and the function is to increase uh, nitric acid to relax the blood vessels. But we can, we can obtain nitric acid naturally from our dark leafy greens. So by doing that, they will improve the heart health and you know, um, improve circulation. And then when we talk about Osteoarthritis, um, we all talk about collagen because there are a lot of collagen supplements right now. But when we do the, because the collagen is very important in making up majority of soft tissues from your skin, uh, the, the blood vessels, your collagen, and also the, the, the bone. It all has different uh, types of collagen inside. But when the body uh, produces collagen, it takes multiple st steps and every step has a uh, specific requirement. So in the three steps, uh, the body needs a 
vitamin C, copper, and zinc to produce matured, good collagen fibers. And those we can obtain from uh, the, the whole food plant-based diet. But at the same time, because it's arthritis, we talk about bone biosynthesis. The bone is really a living organism. It's not a block of concrete just right there. We had a, the, the destruction of the, the bone and rebuilding of the bone every day. We call it remodeling every day. And this requires a lot of minerals and vitamins, including calcium. Everyone knows about calcium. Uh, vitamin D, uh, phosphate, magnesium, vitamin K, vitamin C, zinc, copper, and vitamin A. We, all, we need all of those. Um, you don't really need to take vitamin E, vitamin D. Uh, supplement from that. And you can obtain normally just from a whole food plant based diet. And we talk about atherosclerosis and circulation in the last two presentations also. So here I want to show you this is from 2007 in the publication. This is a cross section of the heart. So you look at the heart, the cross section. The red one means blood. This area, dark, meaning there's no blood. So when there's no blood going through the heart, that's when you have the chest pain, we call it angina, the chest pain. But when you look at this, this person, just following three weeks of plant-based nutrition, three weeks, blood flow was restored, just three weeks. And this is an uh, angiogram. Look at the blood vessels, the coronary uh, artery, the artery is surround, supplying blood to your, to your heart. This one, you see all the brackets right here. Um, by following the plant-based diet for 32 months without cholesterol uh, lowering medication, 32 months, the blood vessel restored. So is it the power of plant-based diet that we can show? scientifically like this, yeah. Movement. Dr. Esa talk about exercise and I like to talk about constant gentle movement. They, they, they are not in conflict, it's just different, um, different view or, or different approach. When we have constant gentle movement, we improve the circulation, uh, we improve the microbiome, yeah, Denise doing what Dr. S mentioned, uh, just do any time. <laughs> yeah, it reduce your musculoskeletal pain. Remember Dr. S mentioned, even with arthritis pain, when you do the exercise, when you have the movement, you actually increase the, the lubrication, you reduce the, uh, the pain right there. Um, when you move around, you improve the the function of a soft tissue surrounding the joint. So it really reduce the pain and you can reduce your stress. And there's a fast versus slow twitch muscles. So this is something very interesting. I imagine when you want to run a 100 meter uh, sprint, what are muscles or are we using? Fast, because we want something just explosive, just run very fast. Uh, these type of muscles, they use glucose because the glucose is the, the energy source, the fuels for, for the cells. They want to burn in quick and then you can generate uh, energy and let you run very fast, that's glucose. And then when they don't have enough glucose, they would, they, would, they also produce a lot of lactate, lactic acid, that's why you have muscle, so, uh, muscle soreness right there. Versus slow twitch, that's the one that for endurance. For example, you wanna hike for one hour, two hours. The, of course, the cells will use glucose first, but after that, because it has time, the cells, the muscles have time to, to look for a new energy source. They tends to use fat, use the lipids in, in the blood. And that's why when we use the slow twitch muscles, we are burning fat in our body. And, and that's why when we talk about gentle movement, uh, we use more of our um, slow twitch muscles and that is good for the long run because we burn, burn more fat inside the body. So what we talk, like to talk about is walking. It's the most popular physical activity among adults. 
there's no special clothes or equipment unless you want something very fashionable. And then otherwise it's free. You can do it anytime, anywhere. And when we, when we walk, we reduce cortisol, which is, is a stress hormone. Uh, we release is the endorphin, which makes us feel good. You also produce epinephrine or afrin. That's increase the fat metabolism. So besides using the, the, the uh, fat in around, surrounding the muscles, we also reduce breaking down all the fat. Release serotonin. We know about serotonin. It, it makes us feel happy. So it's emotional, clarity health. Increase testosterone. They may build your muscles that at the same time reduce the fat. It also increase the estrogen, which improve the move. And so in general, the benefits of when we walk, well, we, re, we lower the risk of, of high blood pressure and heart disease. Uh, we can reduce the blood sugar level, particularly after meals. Now, as I mentioned that the muscle will use the glucose as a fuel, just like any, any cells. Muscle is the largest organ in our body using glucose. So if you walk after meal, especially the large meal, of the day, you uh, dramatically decrease your blood sugar level after walk. So uh, usually recommendation is walk about an hour. Well, but any walking is, is good. And also walking will strengthen and the bones and muscles. The bone is a very tricky organism. It doesn't just grow. It needs stimulation, the stress, the pressure, for, to, to enhance the bone growth regeneration. That means you need the pounding forces from the walking or running to stimulate remodel, uh, remodeling. If you don't do that, it weaken your bones. So gentle walking uh, actually will, in, it will increase your bone density. And walking reduce stress, improve your move, improve your appetite, and improve your sleep quality because you reduce your stress. So what is what I would like to say? Sitting is a new smoking. Um, the recommendation that Dr. Esther mentioned that last week also, 150 minutes of moderate or 700 minutes of vigorous exercise every week, or here I say or, but I really want to measure that 10,000 steps every day. This is our minimum requirement. Um, do some stretching. People don't usually uh, re remember doing the stretching. They say, oh, I exercise every day, but they don't stretch. Um, also, 15 minutes of interval training. I don't know whether you're familiar with interval training, but just 15 minutes of the interval training two to three times a week. They'll greatly improve your, your um, heart health, reduce the risk of metabolic syndrome, um, improve your um, brain health. Yeah. But what's moderate exercise? Dr. Esther mentioned last week, I don't know whether you remember, is you can talk but cannot sing. But you don't want me to sing anyway. So I'm going to use a different way of measuring. It is based on your heart rate range because right now people have the Fitbit or any smartwatch, they like to see their, their heart rate. So when we do the heart rate range, the first thing we wanna know is your maximum heart rate which is 220 minus your age. So when you look at this chart, it's a little bit. So when you look at this chart, if you're, uh, for example, 220, if you're 40 years old, your maximum heart rate will be 180. If your heart, your heart rate is less than 90, 50%, 90, you are not doing much at all you're pretty much like inactive. So we, what we wanna do is put your heart rate between 50 and 60% of maximum heart rate, meaning 90 to 108. That is the time that's moderate. Now um, you, can, you can talk with heavy breathing, or we, can, we say that you can speak in a, a complete sentence. That will be the, the moderate. But when you go up to 60%, 61, you more the vigorate. Um, there's more for, for the heart health, improve your aerobic, the heart health at that time. So but moderates the uh, fat, fat burning activity. And here is more aerobic for your cardio health. 
At this time, you can show talk, but usually it's not in complete sentence. That's, uh, that's how you uh, look at uh, your heart rate. Stress management. Stress promotes release cortisol. We talk about cortisol. Everyone knows about cortisol. And it promotes inflammation. It increases blood pressure. That's what usually people know on your uh, stress and blood pressure. But it also in increases the glucose level. Because remember, uh, cortisol is more of the you know, fight or flight. When you want to fight, or you, you want to have a lot of energy. And that's why the cortisol will, will it promotes the glucose uh, formation. It also reduces immunity. But most importantly, people don't re realize is it degrades soft tissue. So there are two basic types of steroids. The first one is the athlete would take to build muscles. They call anabolic. You take it, you build muscles. The second type is called catabolic. That degrades or um, break down the tissue. And cortisol is a catabolic steroid. That means the cortisol will break down the tissue. When you have an injury like the osteoarthritis, you try to heal, but you have a lot of cortisol going around your body to break down tissue. It, it makes it so hard, um, much harder to heal the osteoarthritis. And that's why uh, it's very good to reduce the cortisol level. And how we do the stress management. This is not a complete list because stress management is very personal. Now, every technique works for some people, but not others. Everyone has different types of um, preference. Some works better than others. Um, physical activity, as we mentioned earlier, nutrition, stress, um, not the physical stress, but the, the mental stress coming between our in our brain. And it has to do with our neurotransmitters, the chemicals in our brain that they help us feel how we feel, our emotion, your memory. And you need to have a balance of those chemicals. It's not that one is better than others. You have to have um, everyone there and in a perfect, in a good um, ratio. And those are uh, generally produced from our food. Now, we don't usually pick up from that. No, it is generated from our food. Then we want to make sure we have the right nutrients to go to our brain to make all those chemicals. And that will help us um, come back our stress at the same time. Meditation, uh, I think people usually have the, the vision image of someone crossing the leg, sitting right there, close the eyes, uh, with pinching your fingers. It is one form of meditation, but med meditation comes in so many different forms. Physical activity is one. The main thing is you want to take your mind off your stress so you can concentrate on, on, on your brain, on your activity. And for example, so you can do uh, any craft. Uh, right now, they have the adult coloring, coloring books just to keep take your mind away. Uh, so that anything is a meditation, you can do uh, tai chi, qigong, uh, all of that is 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 a very good uh, meditation. Music, especially classical music, is very good for stress management, not rock and roll. Okay, <laughs> and restful sleep. We'll talk about sleep later. Spirituality is very uh, important, beneficial in your stress management. Sleep. That is something that people don't usually talk about. And I'm going to spend some time on sleep. Not that I'm going to sleep, but I'm going to talk to you about sleep. We tell people the body heals itself. The body literally heals itself when we're sleeping, especially the deep sleep stages. Now, when we sleep, we have different stages. It is the, in the deep sleep stages that our body heals. And when we have a good sleep, we decrease our appetite. Uh, I don't know whether you have the experience that you, you, you don't have a very good sleep, uh, you feel um, irritable, and you, you're craving for food. The bad thing about craving food from 
the lack of uh, sleep is you usually crave for food they are not good for you. They are more salty or uh, sugary or fatty. Uh, so and then so by have a good sleep, you reduce your your appetite, and they they'll be very good for um, reducing your weight at the same time. And it also decreases your stress and improve your mental clarity. Uh, how do we have a good sleep? Sunlight is very important. Light. Um, we usually know that when we are go under um, sunlight, we have more energy, we feel happier, we have improve our mood. But we didn't realize that the sunlight at the same time initiate our sleep cycle. It actually initiate the production of melatonin, the, the sleep uh, hormone in a few hours. So in the afternoon, when you have the sunlight, it not only wake you up in the afternoon, morning energetic uh, to productive in the afternoon, it also set a stage for a good sleep later on. But at the same time, at night, when we want to sleep, we don't want any sunlight. So people like to talk about paleo, paleo time. If you think back about paleo time, what would people do at night? When, when they slept, there was no light and the temperature was cold. You know, no electricity, no heater yet. And that's why it's very essential about the, the, the darkness and the cold temperature. Those are the key to a good sleep. So when we look at the temperature, Here's body core temperature, so it looks a lot higher. You look at the temperature, it drops the lowest during the deep sleep zone. So if, when you look at this graph, you, 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 you can see that the slowing down process makes you sleepy. The warming up process wakes you up. So in terms of the, we're talking about the core, Temperature, this the temperature that mean pretty much that the heat coming from your body going to your extremities. That is a process of the, the cooling down that we reduce in the core temperature. Um, what can we do to improve that or disturb it is food. If we eat at night close to our bedtime, our body is still doing digestion. The digestion itself uh, causes inflammation, meaning it increase the bar well, core temperature. So the recommendation is not to eat at least three hours before bedtime. We want it a lot longer, but at least three hours. Uh, the same, same idea is about exercise. You don't wanna go around the track or anything too close to the bedtime. Again, the recommendation is three hours. That will make you excited um, increase your body temperature and it's harder for you to sleep. But this is, is not about the yoga. You, you like to do yoga, gentle stretching to relax yourself for the bedtime, that's okay, perfect, okay. We're talking about the running or the type of exercise. Hypertension, when people have hypertension, high blood pressure, that means they have more blood accumulated in your core in area and they'll increase the temperature at the same time. And that means it's harder for you to fall asleep. And people sometimes wake up in the middle of the night, they say, oh, I can fall asleep, but I'll wake up uh, in the middle of the night. Usually I'll recommend that look at your bedding, your mattress, because if you stay in one place too long, you increase your temperature and you, 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 you substantially move, turn your body to move to a cold, colder, uh, colder place cooler place to fall asleep again. So that's why we, 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 would, we would turn um, at night. But most of the time we don't, it doesn't bother us. We can just sleep and do it without knowing. But once in a while you wake up, wake us up. So if you can do some strategy, look at your bed in your mattress, uh, make sure they maintain a, a cold temperature. Uh, it will make you sleep much better. So that's temperature. Social connection. Uh, these are two people together. It's not a potato chip Pringles. So just in case you wonder, it is two people together. Um, social connection, it provides a lot of support. It's our 
uh, support network. And um, it's more fun working to the, together. You know, it's much better doing in a group, just not just by yourself. So the, the Surgeon General a few weeks ago just declared uh, US having a pandemic of loneliness. And pain usually associated with loneliness because when people have pain, they don't like to go out. But at the same time, when, when people are lonely, they actually increase their pain. So um, loneliness will increase pain, osteoarthritis or any arthritis, one of the signs is pain. So by having a social network, they'll help us reduce the pain right there. Passion, passion is a purpose. What you wake up in the morning, what, what you like to do the most. That is a passion, that's the purpose in life, what you like to do. There's usually motivation. A lot of time we say, why this patient doesn't follow our direction is not com compliant of, of the treatment plan. And a lot of time by talking to them about their passion will increase their compliance, the, uh, improve their motivation, improve the outcome. That is a passion. Okay, so in summary, for ankle osteoarthritis, we wanna assess about mechanics. We look at the anatomical structure, look at the soft tissue functions, look at the walking, and let's look at the, the biomechanics. At, at the same time, we wanna look at the lifestyle adjustment, look at their nutrition, their activity, uh, their passion, their sleep, um, their stress, and their social networking. Any questions? Uh, if anyone has questions, please uh, raise your hand. Actually, um, if everyone would pop on screen, if you have questions, it would be nice to see everybody's faces. Um, raise your hand, wave to me. You can only do that if you put your screen on. <sighs> Recommending screen on time here, guys. Um, I know I have a few here. Let's see. Uh, I have a couple of questions, so I'll get us started. Um, okay, so a couple of things that 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 came to my mind as we were talking. Um, we mentioned, you mentioned salt. So I'm going to go to the, nutri start at the nutrition piece. Um, and this is something that people ask all the time or say all the time, oh, but I use really good salt. I use that Himalayan sea salt. I use kosher salt. Are we looking at reducing or removing salt 100% from our diets because we can get it from our uh, whole food plant-based diet? Uh, I will not say it's removing uh, salt from our diet. What I mean is we have enough salt naturally from our food already. So it's from our diet, it's not added salt. The oil, when you talk about all the sea salts, Himalaya salt, that increases um, mineral contents with the salt. You should eat in salt. So even it's, it's better, uh, but it is a salt. Okay, thank you. So you're, you're right, it was the additional salt. Right. Um, you talk so along the lines of food. Uh, you mentioned collagen supplements, and you're right. I see them everywhere. Do the actual do supplements like that work? Um, do they? I guess yes. Do they work? Because I know so often we say you know the way they're digested or the mechanism. You know, does it add something to your? you know, is it beneficial? Is it not beneficial? Or are you just taking something, spending money, and then just, you know, peeing it out? It is not necessary. I, I wouldn't say it didn't work because you now you provide the building blocks for, for the, the soft tissue, for the bone. Uh, you remember, it, 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 the collagen there, the collagen doesn't go to your body, go to the joints. It should be degraded into protein and the body had to build again. So it's the same as eating more um, protein sources like beans, legume, you, you get the same thing. The only argument is um, there is one type of um, amino acid that making it is protein that is, that is not as common, but you can eat food that has more protein and then still give you the, in the same building blocks. So, it's not that it's not working, it's just not necessary. I love it, thank you so much for that. Um, we talked about, you talked about stretching and yes. the benefits of stretching. Let's talk stretching and flexibility. 
You know, mm-hmm. we think stretching, oh, I'm, I have tight muscles, I should stretch. But what is the benefit of stretching and flexibility? Well, stretching flexibility is really um, make sure that your joints are working properly. So for example, um, if one would look at the ankle, when you have very tight Achilles tendon, imagine that it's so tight, what would you do? You're actually walking tiptoe because mm-hmm. the tendon is so tight, have to pull you back. That's an extreme case. But then if you just reduce a little bit, but still tight, that means you're putting more weight in front of your, your, your feet, not the whole foot, it's just more your feet. And then if, when you shift, you're putting more weight on the front of your joints too. So you, you get more uh, wear and tear in front of your joints. And just like I mentioned, I uh, showed up earlier, the osteoarthritis doesn't happen across the joint. It's one specific area. So in this case, you're putting more uh, stress in the front of the joint. Sure. Right. And I can, I can, I can see that when, you know, when I we used to say that time the Achilles tendon, I'm like, oh yeah, that, that's something I'm, I'm dealing with right now. And you're right. I tend to kind of like lean forward and I can, I can tell when I'm, when I start walking that way, you know, I feel it in my ankles. I feel it in my knees. Um, yes. And then my hips after a while feel like they're, they're not off or, or they're not um, uh, in the right position. Uh, by, uh, yeah. So stretching flexibility, all of this is so is, is essential to um, ankle um, health. Right. Right. Okay. Anyone else? I still have another question, but if anybody else wants to jump in, feel free. Okay. I have a question. So Mark, my husband and I are both runners. He's a, he's been a runner his entire life. I started about 15 or 20 years ago. He's, he's much more avid runner than I. Sometimes when we're running, we notice people, we we notice how people are running. Not necessarily how we are running, but we notice how other people (laughs) run. And a lot of times people will run and the foot kind of does this little flicky thing. Yes. How does that affect someone's ankle joint health, um, but also their ability to continue to run uh, down the road? Well, when they're running, just like you mentioned, pointing out, you just imagine you're putting them as a knock knee position. So when mm-hmm. you have a knock knee, the, the feet will go out, the legs will go out. So, so, so you're putting more stress on the medial side, meaning closer to your body. So um, that, that, that is a consequence that you're going to wear out a certain part. However, I've been told by runners, they will not change the way they run because there are so many ways of running, different running technique. You can, you can change your loading by changing the way of, of your uh, running pattern, your running technique, you will move the stress to a certain part of your foot. Mm-hmm. And I've been told by people, even though they know they have uh, pressure in certain part of your foot, they will not change because that's the way they run. Interesting. That is interesting because I when uh, years ago, my sister and when we were in high school, we were on in track and they used to say, you know, make sure, you know, heal the toe, heal the toe. And then as when I started running um, years later, it wasn't so much heal the toe, it was more midfoot kind of yes. um, because like, you know, you're kind of more bouncing as opposed to every time you're hitting your heel, you're heel. almost stopping. Right. right. So that's the two basis type. Unless you're doing sprint, sprint, you they, they put a, a uh, stress on the forefoot. Mm-hmm. That's a sprint. But otherwise, people usually yes, uh, there's a two basic pattern that uh, the runner will use. Interesting. Thank you. So Al has a question. Al, if you would like to come off of mute. There yes. Uh, hi. Uh, I, when I wake up in the morning, my left ankle is stiff. You know, but then after a little warming up. That is fine. So is that is on my left ankle, and uh, is that something that you know is, I should worry about, or just simply that's a nature of the thing? Yeah, you should worry about. There are two things. Number one, it's very um, common, uh, consistent with soft tissue issue. When you have soft tissue issue, that like they mentioned your ankle, or people have their the so-called heel pain, plantar fasciitis. They usually, uh, it's more painful first thing in the morning or after long sitting because 
when you just wake up in the morning or after a long sitting, the soft tissue contract. And then when you stretch, when you started to move that the, the tissue being stretched, that's why you have pain. But after a while, the tissue uh, warm up and then you regain the flexibility and the pain goes away. Mm -hmm. That's very common. That's very in, indicative of soft tissue injury. And secondly, it's not uncommon to have pain on one side because that, that tells me that that's a mechanical issue. And just like and most of the uh, osteoarthritis is a mechanical issue and it's usually uh, happen on one side. Yeah. So uh, what kind of treatment I should, what should, what should I do to it's really, really need to look at the whole body. Mm -hmm. Now, the body is very interesting. Now, if you have left ankle issue, it doesn't mean that your problem is on the left. It could be the, the, the problem is on the left side, but could be the problem is the right side, but then you're shifting your weight to your left side. So it, it always requires a physical exam to really look at the root cause, not just treating the ankle. Okay, thank you. No. I think that's an, an important point. You know, everything that we talk about, um, you know, we want to look at, go to the, find what the root cause is. Too often we want to just fix the problem, whatever it may be, whether it's um, people want to lose weight, people have, you know, pain, headache, mm -hmm. whatever it may be, but there's always some kind of underlying issue um, that we have. And I know, for example, with my left ankle, I was born with my foot kind of deformed, like literally my toes touched my, my heel and my whole foot was twisted upside down. Mm -hmm. So I have elongated ligaments and tendons in my mm -hmm. ankle. So I've known that my entire life and, you know, well, no, that's not completely true. I've known that since I was an athlete in high school. I didn't know that when I was younger, when I would constantly, you know, twist my ankle and, you know, have a sprained ankle and all of those things. Mm. Looking back to find out what the actual problem was, was so much easier to, to kind of fix the problem, knowing what the real problem was, rather than trying to, um, you know, do everything else uh, that possibly could make it feel better, but didn't actually fix the problem. Mm. So I appreciate that. Uh, let me see. I, I see a question about a stretching. So usually there, um, what I like to do is you, you check out the stretching exercise for the knee flexor. They call the knee flexors. That is usually the exercise I like. When you stretch the knee flexors, you actually stretch the muscles uh, controlling both your uh, your legs and your thigh. That's a knee flexor you want to stretch. But then you want to strengthen your quads, the front of your, your leg, the uh, front of your thigh. Those muscles usually are not as strong. So you want to um, strengthen the muscles and then stretch your back and, you, and then you're good. And I'm sure there's plenty, there's loads of great uh, videos on YouTube for that. Also, right, right. right. Lovely. Well, we, we have um, one whole minute left. If anybody else wants to uh, add anything, uh, if not, um, we can. One more yeah. question. This week, this is, uh, session being recorded, would it be available somewhere on pub? It's going to be on YouTube or something. Is that? Uh, yeah. yeah, you'll be able to find the the replay on uh, Rochester Clinic uh, to, on their website. Uh, it'll also be up on my on my YouTube channel at Living Healthy List. Um, but mm -hmm. all and all of the recorded um, wellness on Wednesday uh, presentations are on uh, the Rochester Clinic, uh, RochesterClinic.com. Yes. Thank you. Certainly. Okay. Well, then I hope everyone has found this information to be incredibly interesting and helpful and really life-changing. Please, please join us again next week for Wellness on Wednesday, uh, June 21, when we will have Dr. Amy Rabatin from Mayo Clinic Rochester. Um, she'll be here to uh, share with us how movement is good medicine for kids too. So really looking forward to that uh, conversation with Dr. Rabbiton. It'll be a little bit of a different uh, take on what we talk about more often. We're usually talking about you know, older people and aging and uh, adults. So it'll be interesting to bring in, you know, how do we bring this to children? So when they get to our age, they're doing better than we are today.
So thank you everyone for being here. Please, you know, again, we'll be here next week and you can sign up for the presentations uh, on rochesterclinic.com. We will see you next time. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you.